He was about to begin, and our next guest is Mikey Drennan. Mikey, good to have you, Gossip. Thank you. Now, the women are all going, ooh, look at him, Jesus, isn't he lovely, me missus included. Um, you know, the, 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 what do you call your man, Beckham? You're like your man, Beckham. <laughs> Sympath's athletic version of Mr. Beckham. David Beckham, yeah? yeah, that's his name. Mikey, you're here to talk to us about a much more serious subject than all of that. Yes. You, let's start. You are, as a young kid, at the age of 16, you went to Ashton, Aston Villa. Then you were loaned to Portsmouth. And you were on the crest of a wave, like so many young men who, like yourself, who made it in the, in the soccer world. But something happened. What happened? Well, I won't say I made it. <laughs> but you were about to make it. I could say that. It's all ifs and buts. But um, I suppose went over to Aston Villa when I was 16. Um, going over to be a footballer, living every young lad's dream. Especially coming from Kilkenny, you're, you're normally born with a hurl in your hand. But I suppose went went over and had had five not great years there that a lot of people would say, why didn't you? You're going over to live everyone's, every young lad's dream. And I think when everyone says you're a footballer, like they automatically think of Ronaldo, David Beckham, people that have actually made it, making, making millions and that. And but that's everybody's dream, to make it in the big soccer world, because the, mon- the money is humongous. Yes, it is. But that's what I mean. But as, as a young lad going over, especially from Kilkenny, when there's probably only three or four people from Kilkenny that have actually gone, gone across to England and and uh, I suppose it was, it was a big thing. I was meant to be the next big thing. Every young lad going over is meant to be the next big thing but I had a lot of things on my plate that I probably didn't even realise people saying I'm the next Robbie Keane, there's no other goal scorer like me. All that kind of stuff all the way up through the international stages and I suppose at the time I didn't think, because I wouldn't think anything of that. Like I was like, I'm, I'm never going to be like him or, or anything like that. And I suppose um, starting at Aston Villa was probably the, the, the start of probably all the downhill of when, from when I was 16. It must have been overwhelming as a 16-year-old kid. You were projected into the big league. Like you're, it's like being a child star. You're suddenly in Hollywood. You're gone from the stage in uh, the local theatre in Kilkenny and you're in Hollywood. You're a star. What does that do to your head, by the way, before we move any further? Like, how yeah. does that... Um, I suppose I'm kind of that person. I don't really kind of take those kind of things on. Like people say, oh, you're going to be the next thing that you don't have to worry about anything else. You're going to have so many houses. You're going to have cars. You're going to have all this kind of sort of stuff. But... None of that came true, like, and as I was going over every, like, there probably was pressure that I, I probably realised now at the time that everybody knew me, like, I'd, I'd go anywhere and everybody, like, if I went to the toilet, people would know about it, like, all that, that kind of stuff that I couldn't do anything, and probably at the time, I didn't think anything of it, I was just let it all kind of go over my head. But when you were, you were in the, let's work out the, sort of how all this works logistically. <clears throat> you're a young lad, you're 16. You're a child. Uh, you go over there. Who minds you? Who chaperones you? Uh, is there a is there a is there a support mechanism around you to help you? Um, no, that's that's probably the part that I was going to come to. That you're literally going over there at sixteen. You're leaving your family, your friends, everything behind you. Since you're young, lad that you've ever known, and then you're just put over. Get your bags, you're in this digs with another lad and living with a strange family that you don't know and then tell you to be, so tomorrow be here at the train station at half nine, we'll pick you up. That's it. But, this is nine years ago. This is 2010. If this happened like with some of many of the Irish soccer team stars who through the years, they went 30, 40 years ago. Uh, this is only 10, this is nine years ago. Yeah. So there was no... Like, you're a child, but there was no protection uh, program around you, or no protection uh, infrastructure around you. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you go along, a 16-year-old goes to any organization, even here, you know, you're going to play football, there are child protection officers, there are people there to guide and mind the kid. Uh, 
You said there was none of that around you. No, not really. There was people there to say that you're you're coming over here. You're not, like you're an adult. You have to be professional. But yeah, like on a Wednesday night, we had to be in at nine o'clock. So like there was no. We, we used to have this argument with them saying you want us to be adults, but yet you want us to be in at nine o'clock on a Wednesday. Like so, we can't go to the cinema or or anything like that. It's all those little things that things need to change. Like they they need to do stuff for people that come over from Ireland, people that come over from Spain, France, mm. people that don't even speak the language, like, they're literally just thrown there and that's it, like. You're so li- you're living in, in an apartment, I presume, it's probably a well-appointed apartment. No, I was living in the digs. <coughs> living in the digs with... You were living uh, in digs family, with the, yeah. it, it, Okay. Um, so what started happening to Mikey Drennan? Um, I suppose <laughs> probably the first three years, I. Sp- I struggled a lot but when I went onto the football field kind of I forgot about everything and everything was kind of going well for me then and and you know I don't remember I'd never forget I used to always go back train come back from train and go back into my room I used to have a lock my lock it close across the curtains and get into my boxers and just lay in bed and it could half 12 in the day sun splitting the stones and I'd have the curtains across watching telly that used to be my routine every single day didn't want to go out. Lads be like text me, oh, I don't want to go do something. I just say no, don't want to do it. And I just wanted to be by myself. And especially at that age, like you, you don't know, you don't know why you're, you're like that. You're crying in my room, all that sort of stuff. You go get fags, you go get drink. I'm meant to live this professional lifestyle, and I just didn't care really. Had you, you had lots of money? Probably. Well, for some at that age, yeah. <laughs> I did. I was. I was on. A, I was on thousand euro a week, like and a thousand euro a week at sixteen years of age. A thousand pound. A thousand pounds. That's about twelve, thirteen hundred euro. Yeah, and at that age, you're Jesus, people you're, twenty times your age never play get here and that, and they're successful. That's what I mean, like and like. I, so what were you doing with the money? Uh, gambler. So this was where, okay, this is where the the, the problem starts. Yes. I, Ta- talk us through it. I suppose this is the day that will probably stick by me that I'll regret for probably as long as I live. I mean, the day I hit 18, I'll never forget walking into Coral on, uh, in Sutton Caulfield and I literally had, I think I had 1,200 in my account because I, wasn't, I was only on £150 at this stage and then blew everything. That following month is when I signed my pro contract, got my big money and big sign-on fees and stuff. And literally, Monday to Sunday, no matter what, I was in that Coral Bookies and I became best friends with the... What were you betting on? Horses. Did you ever bet on horses before you left Kilkenny? No, didn't have a clue about them. So when did you begin to realise there was a problem here? Um. I suppose it probably about about six months before I probably left to go back home to, to Ireland. I, rang my, I got paid on the Friday and I lost every single penny on that Friday. And I had a month to go to get paid and ringing my mother crying saying, what am I after doing? Like I could have gave that money to you. I could have put that away. I could have I had a car to pay for. I had a loan yeah. to pay for. I had diesel, I had insurance, all that sort of stuff. And, just those days that I'll never forget, like is on the Friday, I just didn't, I didn't care. Like in my head, I wanted to get that buzz of the highs and lows. Hmm. And it was always a low, like. How much do you think you squandered in all of that time? To, di- to date, I was trying to fit probably over 80 grand. When did you begin to realize you had a problem with that? When did you realise that this is much more insidious than just a bad old habit? Probably when I came back to Shamrock Rovers. When I, I was in England for the five years and everything was going well. I was going to get a new contract. I was going to start playing first team. Mm. I was getting capped with Captain Ireland. I was top scorer in the Champions League under 19s. Everything was going brilliant. Then I broke my foot and everything went downhill from there. The physio... I went into the physio in November of 2013 
I said, there's something wrong with my foot. It's a bit, it feels like a bruise. And he was like, yeah, it's only a bruise. It's checked it up. And then in January, we were playing Ajax in the quarterfinal of the Champions League. Scored, scored a goal, celebrated, and it broke. And everything since then just went downhill. Um, I was meant to get operated on straight away. That didn't happen. I was meant to... Um, <clears throat> I was meant to go see see someone that was meant to properly look after it. Um, that physio eventually got fired for, for what he'd done. And um, I suppose that led to me kind of coming back home and uh, come back to Shamrock, Shamrock Rovers. I want to be closer to home. And my agent um, said, you need to be closer to home. And he, was, he used to always ring me every day saying, what's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? And I'd be crying and I just wouldn't know why. He was like, are you depressed? But I never knew what depressed was. What, what, what is that? What's that word? And he used to always say it. What, are you depressed? Why are you so sad? And I was just like, I don't know, what's, what's affecting you? And all, all that stuff that... It, it, when people um, have major addiction problems, um, one of the, story, the, 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 the most common thread you hear from the stories, for there's an alcoholic, drug addict, gambler, um, is that they have to reach rock bottom. And when you reach rock bottom, something catastrophic happens that is, in a lot of cases, life-changing, where people realise, hang on a minute, I am really wrong here. But it's normally people are much older than yourself. You're still a child to a lot of us older people. You heard our last great star talking about grey-haired people, every grey-haired, I get up everybody up. But, um, when did you reach rock bottom? Uh, when I was at Shamrock Rovers in my second year, um, I was there for the first full season then I think it was about eight games well it was probably even before I knew hit rock bottom but what, what was the rock bottom moment what was that, 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 that what was that moment that eureka moment that people talk about where you know the light bulb moment where I said shit I'm in real I'm in, I'm in deep in here I've got a problem uh, where I tried to overdose tell us about that I suppose I was in Dublin. There was, I was, came back somewhere like I had my own apartment, fourth floor, everything like that, own balcony, own everything. Like I was, but that was probably the worst thing that could probably ever have happened to me is to get my own place. Drinking, smoking, started doing drugs. I started. What kind of drugs were you doing? Uh, cocaine. Coke, yeah, okay. Doing all that sort of stuff, and you're meant to be living this footballers. Didn't care, like there's drug, drug testers coming in. I, didn't care if I got caught. Um, I was out on the balcony one day and I was just like, is this worth it? Like, is, a, this, is the feeling you have in here that just never goes away? That rotten feeling and I was on tablets and all that, but they kept me, they kept me saying... You, when you say you were on tablets, you were on, you were on antidepressants? An antidepressants, yeah, I was on them. And but they weren't helping, but you were still doing coke. Yeah. You were still doing the juice, the gargle. And you're still gambling. And still gambling. And so all that high, and then going back down to a low, and then trying to go into training and act like nothing's happening is... Very hard to physically so. run the length of a pitch after a load of coke and gargle. And very good about the gambling, but physically it must start affecting your body. Oh, physically, yeah. I start putting on weight, they start noticing. And then the manager, it was Pat Fallon at the time, came in and said, look, you need to go, you need to take a break. He said, take two weeks, go home and decide. But he didn't know about any of this other stuff. I haven't told any, The only person I told was the doctor. Now, who told you this? Uh, Who's the person said that to you? What was the role? Uh, Alan Byrne. The, uh, he was the doctor for, right. at the same end. He was the one that actually diagnosed me with. That I was, he said I was severely depressed, even though I was in England for five years. Mm. And I used to go crying to that doctor, and he never... And you would have been going to a doctor who would have been dealing with the professional footballer association in the UK, and he would have dealt with guys because one of the inherent problems of that kind of business where kids are given some, sometimes a grand a week and then suddenly there's a hundred grand a week, how did they deal with all that madness? Because intellectually they find it very difficult to deal with it. But you're saying that you had to come home to Ireland for somebody to say, hang on a minute, we have a problem here. Yeah, because my agent said, you have to come home, he said, to get your head right, he said, revamp your career 
and probably coming home, the fact that I was in Dublin only an hour away from Kilkenny, mm. uh, it, was, it was the worst thing that could happen. I could see, like at that age, when you're, like people probably don't realise that like, I've never gone to a Debs, like, little things like You've this. Been that I've never night. been to a Debs. I'll like, tell you one thing, there's any amount of women I say looking at this and they're screaming. <laughs> I was thinking, well, you'd be going to a few Debs nights after tonight, my old son, that's for sure. If they're, you know, like, just, that, like some of the ladies asked like me to say that, that yeah. to you. And, uh, like, even, like, graduate say, like, because I left school when in, in fourth year, like, um, never went to graduation, any of that sort of stuff. I've never experienced college life, anything like that. But then people say it to me, kind of, as what Alan was talking about, why, why do you care? You're a, you're a footballer. Why you said but I'm, I, I class a footballer as when they're at the top, mm. at the very top, and when they've made it, and you can actually be called an actual footballer. Like, um, it's, it, what was the trigger? What was, you know, when you peel away, you, go, you went to counselling, you peel away, it's like an onion, you peel away all the sides, and you keep peeling away and back until you find what's the source of the problem. In your case... What was the source of this problem? The that source was this? constantly going gambling and drinking. Yeah, but what, what was, the, what was what, causing you to, what to was do causing, what was the What was the trigger? What was the motivation factor? What was the past subliminal? Time. Past time. Just the past time. Boredom. It was boredom. Boredom. Just the past times. You, you used to go into the bookies and after a trend, you'd be there probably till about 9 o'clock at night when it closes. Like, and to be not even races on, you'd be just, you'd be just in there, like, and they'd all know you. And think about now, like, I, like, was it suddenly that you found yourself as well in a in a sort of a situation in your life where, like, we when we <clears throat> were all young at that age, 16, 17, 18, 20s, and uh, we'd love to be living in a world where we could be completely deregulated, where we could do whatever thing we want. Did you find yourself in that situation? Was that was that sort of like? You had no norms, to, there was no rules, there was no regulation, you just do what you like. All, just as long as you could run up and down the field and play a game afterwards. Yeah, well, I think you have a responsibility of, you have to look after yourself. <clears throat> because but you're, you're 16 years of age, you're 17 years of age, you're 18 years of age, you're 19 years of age. But that's what they expect of you as, an, as a professional athlete, is to look after yourself. Because you're the only person that can, you're the person that's going to run, like, like they say it's a team game, but like, Say if you go along and break your leg, like the team don't break the leg, you break your leg. And they always say like there's no I in team, like there's not. But like as an individual, like you have to look after yourself. And yourself is the most important. That's why if I didn't take that break, like I took a two and a half year break from soccer when I left Shamrock Rovers. If I didn't take that break, I wouldn't be here now. And I think that's what would have happened to you. Do you think? I would have committed suicide. I would have some sort of way. I would have found a way if it wasn't over though, so You nearly did it before, though, didn't you? Yeah. Twice. Tell us about those. The one that supposed when the one when I was in Dublin, it was all my antidepressants. I took them, and it was something that just clicked with me. And I was like, "What am I? What am I after doing?" And I kind of I started shaking and just put my fingers down my throat, and they all. I don't think they all came out, but the, most of them came out. And um, I rang someone then back home, and I was crying, I was thinking about half three at night. Mm. Rang him, was crying, hysteric, and I, like, I'd never ring someone, I'd never, I'd never wanted to go to bother anyone. And that was when, then I think it was about two weeks later, that's when I took my break. <laughs> and, and then, I don't think actually anyone ever no, knows this, but I, not even, it was only, Few of my family, about two months ago, I've tried to do it again. Two months ago. Yeah. Why? Um, there was a lot of things going on. There was um, in my life that I just didn't want to have that feeling anymore and and be that way. And only <coughs> for um, my mother was there. I I won't be here because she she saw what I did. I was at home in Kilkenny and. What did you do? took about over 30 tablets, I don't know what they were. And it, she just started sticking her fingers down my throat. Never, I don't think any of my friends know or, or anything like that. But the fact that you're sitting here talking to us tonight, 
uh, is that you want, you don't want this to happen to you again, but you don't want it to happen to anybody else because you're become, you know, you're one of our inspirational talk speakers. That's what I mean. That's tell why us about it. Tell us, share that with the audience. Tell them what you think. <laughs> I suppose like it's, it, I've, I've always had probably, you're always going to have bad days, I think, when you do have depression and it's just how you do. And I've dealt with it probably fairly well up until Christmas when there probably a lot of things happened in Kilkenny with things going on and stuff and that really, really affected me. And, um, and I, I suppose now that I've known, I said, I, like I, I'm back seeing someone again, like, and uh, which I never, which I never probably thought I, I would do again, go and actually see someone professionally again. <coughs> I thought I'd probably just talk to a friend or that, but I needed to do it. And that when it, it really kind of opened my eyes saying that I need to, I need to stop, I need to stop, like, and start going. Because, like, doing these talks, like, it's like, then if I don't look after myself. Yeah. Like, you, why you, are, you, are, you heard uh, the, the various speakers we had tonight, and one of the things is that the big problem with suicide, uh, uh, the, 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 the majority of people who succumb to suicide are young males. Um, what would you say to young Irish males, your own court, you're a, you're, and I, di I didn't mean to sound in any way patronising when I said you're a gossip because I wish to Christ I was 24 again, but anyway. Um, but um, what would you say to them? Like we, 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 the, the big problem we have here is that I think somebody described it one time as the the long-term eternal solution to a very short-term problem. People who are considering that step across the line, what would you say to people, you, you, your peers, the, mm. and you are, part, you are from that cohort of people who are most susceptible to this disease, or, or whatever we want to call it, of the 21st century that we're living in? I say, like, there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is, like, there's always something bigger, and there, there's always someone there for you. You might not think it because you're in that state of mind, but there is always someone there for you, no matter who it is. Like, and as I said, it's all these little things that have helped me through from when I did st from when I did quit quit soccer. I just thought, like, what am I going to do now? I have no education, but yet I still got a job for myself, and I look forward. And I think that's what people need to do: is there is there is light ahead of you, like. And I don't think there's anything kind of more simple than that. And you need to look forward and start being positive and go for a walk, start doing sport, do, go, f go for a jog, all that yeah. active stuff. That's one of the things, though. I remember my old friend Jerry Ryan used to always talk about that before he died. And then I realised he had a bit of a bad habit that he shouldn't have had. But, and he was always talking about... Uh, the endorphins that kick in and the positivity that comes from training and, and we all do training and, and, and various levels of exercise and stuff like that and it lifts you, it gives you that buzz but and the, this is the thing I said, I've said to Quinny many times um, uh, and that was that it is counterintuitive almost that somebody who's fit and that's what everyone assumes, you're fit, good looking dude, Jesus what problems would he possibly have? So it's not all about just the endorphins that kick in from being able to sprint around a field and be really fit. That's what I mean. That's what like it's the old it's the old saying, like never judge a book by its cover, like you don't know what's going inside anyone's head. Like it might be like little things that I've realised in the last few years, like if you're walking past someone like and they look at you, I'd kinda of automatically go well. Like kinda of, like how are you or that's what we say, don't Kenny well. And You're a big star kid, Kenny. Things, like, and, one even if, if it's not even if it's down to Kenny, if it's up in Dublin or if it's wherever, like it's, mm. I, I would always just kind of well, or like a lot of people text me and say that they're, they're struggling or their friend is struggling and stuff. And like when, when the story came out first of when I did, of why I left professional, well, like people from America, Australia, New Zealand, England were all text me saying, oh, thanks so much for coming out. Mm. Um, you're after helping me, my son, and stuff, stuff like that. So it's stuff like that. That's why I, like, if I can do anything, like, to help one person, I'd, I'd do it, like, even, even though you, the main 
priority is yourself. You need to look after yourself, first and foremost. One of the things Quinny was saying as well, and uh, Quinny's older than you. He's not here now, so I can say it, but he won't hit me. But um, <clears throat> a lot older than you. But he was saying about, you know, there is a big, big, it's a big step for a young male, a young Irish male, to go across that threshold where you say, I need help. Not only that, I want to share the fact that I've had this crisis with other people. It's a big thing to do. Yeah. Because everyone says, man up, get your shit together, kid, you're okay, not a problem. You're a big soccer star, who gives a shit? Yeah, because I think at the, at the time I didn't realise it. I just wanted to get it out there because I didn't want people you know, saying the wrong, the wrong thing, oh, he's quit. That's what I mean, he's a failure, he's a waster. He's going to go back now to Kenny and he's going to get back up to his old tricks and all that kind of stuff. And that's why I kind of put it out. But then of the reaction it got, I didn't expect it at all. Didn't expect the reaction at all. What would you say to young men in your own role again, in your, own, in your shoes? I suppose if you're starting off again, keep active. Don't lock yourself away in a room. That's what I've learned most is if I am feeling that I will go for that walk or I'll go to the driving range or I'll go for a game of golf or anything like that, is <coughs> get out and be active. It's it, it, it really does sound, and I say, I, I probably, I'm probably mm. ventilating this on and articulating this on behalf of most people here who are parents, <clears throat> and that is that you went over to Aston Villa in 2010, and I remember seeing uh, Paul Quinn and people like that through the years, you know, going to those famous stories, you know, being left on their own and going to those training camps. This is back in the days of Johnny Giles and people like that. But it sounds to me extraordinary. Like when the GAA have such incredible syst protection systems around kids in sport, you know, appropriate behaviour and protection that a kid is sent away at 16 years of age. But, by the way, did that affect your parents or did that cause your parents any sort of grief? You know, did, did, you know I'm not trying to lay or share any guilt, because there is no guilt in something like this. It, it, it response, there is a degree of responsibility. It's not intended, but did they feel, shit, we sent you over there. We thought you were going to be looked after. Yeah. Oh, they, that's what they said. said if, they, if they know what they know now, they wouldn't have let me over. I, like, I'm shocked when you start telling no me the story. No what they said. They wouldn't be allowed me, because first went to trial of Bill when I was 12, and then all the way up, and they kept on to me, and sign, sign, sign. Once I signed... This is the agents. The, um, yeah. their, their scouts and their yeah. managers and putting me in boxes and to go to watch games and getting the full dinner, everyone looking after you and all that stuff. And then once I signed, then you were signed, they didn't care then. They it was a bit like, it's me. a bit like, if I dare say it, a bit like somebody finding a nice young pony in a field. So he'd grow up to be a fine horse and he'd race and you would just throw him in. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, You're it's just like, thrown into the deep end. Like, like a bit of meat. Mm. Am I, am I wrong in that? Or? No. You're, that's what I mean. Like it's, there needs to be so much more for the money that is in football for young lads going over. There needs to be so much more done. That's, like it's, it's ridiculous, like the stuff that... That's why a lot of kids, like there's 100 people, like players make it. That's what it is like. And to help them, I think there needs to be so much more. Like even to give them that... If you're not good enough, you're not good enough. But to give them that chance to be the, the it's best a meat it's a fucking meat grinder. Yeah. What's the story now? What's happening with Mikey Drennan? I'm looking at a very fine looking young man. All the women in the place are always talking to swooning all over you. Uh, I'm looking at a very fine man. You're fit, you're strong, you're articulate, you're intelligent. You're brutally honest. Well, share with us because we're talking about inspiration and the bright, as you said, the light at the end of the tunnel and everyone's been talking about it. Where next for you? I suppose this year is, I want to see how it goes, like sign with St. Pat's, see how I go, if I, I, want to, I want to try to go back to England to justify what... You want to go back there? I want to go back to just, because I'm more older and mature, I want to go back and justify but, uh, but what... Are you going to be a bit nervous about that? No, because that's what I mean, I'm more older and I'm more mature. Yeah. And I know, I'll know how to deal but with it. But are the demons gone? Are you, are you, you know... Are you, oh, they'll are always you, be there, you can, I think. But you have, a ment you have mechanisms for dealing with those demons yeah. now. It's, it's like now, like, kind of when I was going back up to Dublin, I had that 
am I going to go back into this? But I haven't. I just got a, just got an apartment last week with one of my friends. So all that all that stuff that I probably never thought I I would have done, and everything like that is that's But that is my aim is to go back in because I am that more older and more mature. And I want to give it another go. That and I've absolutely I no doubt that you make Ireland proud again, my old son. I think you're brilliant. And ladies and gentlemen, what a brilliant man. <clears throat> you got about, uh, I'd say about 250 new mammies and about, all, uh, about 50 new girlfriends here already. So you're okay, my old son. Uh, like, you know, what do you say after that? You're an inspiration. And thanks very much for coming. Give him a big hand of applause. Well done, kiddo. Well done, mind yourself, right? Look at that, you get a standing ovation. Look, go by, look behind you. Look, look. Stand up and come up here. Come up. Stand up and look back. Look at them.